Thank you so much for coming, especially those of you who are not in the workshop, the capstone. We really value you, your, your being here. It means a lot to us. Um, I'm just going to be really brief. I just want to thank five people, I think. I want to thank uh, Natalie Onwin Curinari, uh, Jessica Sotomayor, the two uh, administrators who make this work, and then our wonderful TAs, Allison Lee and Sarah Stender. Without the four of them, this would not work, period. So, and I also want to thank Kevin uh, Griffin, who is the, uh, runs our program and has given us this wonderful opportunity to keep doing the capstone. It's a real honor. Um, so that's really it. I'm going to turn it over to you guys. We have the first team coming up. I just want to say two things. Uh, during the Q&A, uh, so you can decide who wants to stand up here while you're speaking. Uh, you, you can all come up. These are short. These are going to be short presentations, 10 minutes, tops. Uh, so you can either all stand up here and then what you can do, um, or if you don't want to all stand up just to speak, that's fine too. But during the Q&A, you should all come up because often a couple of you will field questions. Uh, the other thing is when you do the Q&A, please speak into this microphone because you're being recorded. Okay, so I'll turn it over to our first team, Energy. So we are the Energy Strong um, team, and we were tasked in January 2014 to investigate how we could motivate more responsible energy use among the cadets at the United States Military Academy, um, also known as West Point. Um, we spent the last three months looking into economic behavior, various case studies, and different methods that universities are using across the country to cut their energy usage. Um, and out of that research, uh, four basic recommendations have emerged. The first is to institute a mock bill. Uh, the second is to use a real-time web-based feedback system. The third is to initiate a campus competition between the U.S. Uh, Military Academy and the U.S. Naval Academy. And the fourth is to institute a sustainability management office. Um, we're going to talk really briefly about each of these recommendations. Um, as you in the capstone workshops will know, there's also a very long report which accompanies this research. So if you want any more information about the background or any more details about the recommendations specifically, um, we would be happy to dis disseminate this report and we'll also take questions at the end of this presentation. Um, one of the things that we would like to highlight is this is so important because these people who are the, are the cadets at USMA are going to be the future leaders of the entire military and um, instilling them with a sense of how important sustainability and energy efficiency is will really go a long way in the long term towards um, sustainability in the military at large. So without further ado, uh, Mikhail's going to talk about the mock billing system. All right, so we were tasked with coming up with a mock billing program and instituting it at West Point. Um, the idea with the mock bill is to give people a sense of how much energy they're using, um, how much it would have cost them if they were responsible for paying. Um, but of course, at, in universities and in the military as well, um, there isn't that responsibility built in. Um, energy costs are part of, of the everyday, and it's assumed that the institution takes care of it. Um, so the idea is to um, give them a sense of what they're doing by giving them a bill that looks like a real bill, um, but it's essentially just based, on, it's just meant to be an educational tool. Um, and so we looked at a number of universities, um, University of Arizona being one of them, and we looked at military installations as well. Um, and that was our, our main finding, that though they had um, many positive aspects, um, for the most part they were used as educational tools. And we wanted to take it a step further. Um, and this was kind of our mandate from the United States Military Academy, and that was to change behavior um, at, among the cadets. Um, and so we decided to build in um, some more aspects of um, social science and um, economics, um, yeah, so, and, and economics, um, and to get, us, to get them actually motivated um, to, to change their behavior through the mock bill itself. Um, and so the first thing that we did was we built in um, framing. Framing is the way that you present information um, to get people to understand it more clearly and also get a sense of where they stand um, to help them understand what they might do to improve their, um, their energy use. Um, the second was comparison. So we used comparison um, of each cadet to the average and to the most efficient users um, in a number of different aspects on the mock bill, which we can't cover fully in detail. Um, but the idea then, again, is that um, you know, these are insights from behavioral economics that, that really push people to, to save more energy than they would um, otherwise. Uh, and we also wanted to build in actual incentives into the mock bill itself. Um, and so in a regular mock bill, you, know, you, can, you can 
um, notice that you're using more energy or less energy than everyone else. Um, but we wanted to create a reason for them to actually save um, that wasn't monetary as it would be in a normal situation. Um, and so we built in a reward system that awards points based on how much money you would be saving, um, points that can be redeemed for actual privileges and prizes um, to be determined by the administration. Um, so in this way, we created a mock bill that, that actually focuses on changing behavior um, and not just being used as an educational tool. And I'm going to hand it off to Sammy again. So um, we really believe that the mock bill is a good, way, a good first step, but uh, by combining it with a uh, real-time web-based feedback system, we could really improve the effectiveness of, of such a mock bill. Um, one of the reasons is because you can just get a much more granular set of data. So instead of seeing your data for one month, you can see it for every minute. We've heard um, testimony about some of these systems that you flip a light switch off in a room and the chart goes down on the internet. So um, that's a pretty pretty sensitive and, and cool way to look at it. Um, and so beyond being sort of an informational tool, it also becomes an educational tool. Uh, the system that we recommend West Point uses Lucid Design Group's dashboard system. And the reason for this is that this particular system has been incredibly effective in colleges and universities across the country. Um, and part of the reason for that is that it's a very, it has a very user-friendly interface. Um, so you can kind of see, this is a Oberlin uh, College, uh, and this is just a screenshot of the system, but um, essentially you can, there are tabs on the right side, you can look at your usage in kilowatt hours in CO2 emissions, which really reinforces that, um, that relationship between electricity usage and, and carbon output. And you can also see it in dollars, so it familiarizes students with um, on-demand pricing of electricity. For instance, at peak hours, electricity will be more expensive. Um, and then this chart here that um, orange portion shows what's going on today. The gray portion is what happened yesterday, so you can compare on those times. You can also compare um, from the whole week, the month, the year, so you can look at various data sets. We really think that this system is going to give, um, it's kind of the most bang for their buck. It's going to give them the most benefit um, for the least amount of money. Um, and so we did do a, a economic analysis of what this would cost West Point. It's going to be about $50,000 to cover 20 buildings initially. Um, that cost, that would be for one year. The cost goes down to $27,000 for three years. Um, we also looked at how much it would save them because that's really what they want to know is the money. Um, and a conservative estimate is between 3 and 7% savings using this system. So uh, West Point has an $8.8 .8 million electricity bill. Um, so 3% savings would save them. $260,000, and 7% would save them $620,000. So this system would pay for itself in a matter of months. Uh, we also looked into some ways of funding it. We're not going to go into that now, but if you do want more information, we can certainly give that to you. Uh, the second thing is an energy competition with the United States Naval Academy. Uh, we were really struck when we went there about how competitive the Army and Navy are. Their football field literally reads Beat Navy instead of Go Army. Oh, it also says Go Army, but... Uh, this is, you know, this is a very intense rivalry, and so we think that you can get above average savings um, from an energy competition if you utilize the system. Um, generally, energy competitions save about nine kilowatt hours per student, um, so that would be forty thousand for West Point and seven thousand, forty thousand kilowatt hours and seven thousand um, dollars. But with the uh, while competing against the Naval Academy, we think they could save about 15, 115,000 kilowatt hours, which would save about $20,000. So that's an extremely above average savings. Um, we also recommend that they uh, collaborate with Campus Conservation Nationals, which is a system that we've used um, at Columbia. And it gives you an on-ramp usage of Lucid with a slightly less, slightly less features, but it would be a good way for the Academy to begin uh, using the system. So the next recommendation is going to look at sustainability at West Point from a more logistical approach rather than a technical one, as my colleagues have already outlined, with the idea being that here at Columbia, most of us hopefully know that we have an Office of Sustainability, which really works to oversee most of the green initiatives that we see happening here on campus, and in general, maintaining the campus dialogue of sustainability 
relevant and uh, continuing to exist here amongst our peers. Uh, and one of the first things that I noticed when we met with West Point, the West Point client, is that they did not have any sort of administrative foundation for sustainability management at all. Uh, currently what they have is an energy council, which is basically a volunteer group of faculty who are interested in advocating for sustainability at West Point. And so they've been managing a lot of the energy efficiency programs there that have occurred thus far. Uh, but I think that in order to achieve maximum success with all of the future initiatives that they want to carry out, including things like mock bills and energy competitions, they really need to more formally integrate sustainability into their administrative structure. And so this next recommendation is that uh, sus that West Point must establish a sustainability office on campus uh, to serve as a type of home base for all things regarding energy efficiency and sustainability. And why should they do this? Basically, uh, this office would be great as it could serve as a type of hub for all things regarding energy efficiency, and it would really help to centralize all of those projects that are currently being managed by different parts of the administration currently. Uh, and the key thing about this office is that it would have a team of dedicated staff who would be able to prioritize sustainability sustainability as their number one uh, initiative just because currently at the with the Energy Council the faculty are also faculty and they have to deal with their students and grading papers so they're not always able to invest all of their time and energy into actual uh, energy efficiency projects uh, and in, in general this would increase better collaboration with other administrative departments that are involved in sustainability which will lead to better results and longevity in green project management in general and when we were presenting to West Point, uh, one of the key things I wanted to have them understand is that having a sustainability office brings a type of prestige factor uh, that would be really important for a community of people who are very patriotic of their of the military in general and of their goals as Army cadets uh, because having a sustainability office shows that West Point would not just want to be a participant in sustainability but also a leader uh, by showing that they are really more want to become more serious about uh, pursuing sustainability as a long-term priority uh, and again as we mentioned their rivalry with the Navy would be helpful in uh, persuading them to kind of take on this role model type status uh, to show other military academies that uh, sustainability does work in a military academy type situation rather than just other traditional liberal arts colleges. And so again, the takeaway is just that uh, this would serve as a primary platform from which all other energy recommendations could come from. And uh, these last two ideas really quickly are just uh, more examples of other energy initiatives that uh, the, uh, something like an office could actually lead in the future, uh, especially employing something like the STAR sustainability management system, which would really help with data recording and management, and of course adopting the 2012 U.S. Army sustainability goals, which will really again kind of help promote, promote the sustainability conversation at USMA in general. So. Okay, well, that was a very brief overview of what we've been doing the last three months. Um, I'd like to invite the rest of our team up to take a few questions if you have any. Any questions? Wow. <laughs> Thanks. It was, it was a really interesting presentation. Uh, did you have any opportunity to pilot this, or do you anticipate that they'll subsequently do that at the academy? Well, so one of the things that was really exciting about this project is we actually got to loop in the Navy a little bit, and I ended up having a conference call with one of the high-up high people at um, the sort of facilities department at the Navy, at the Army, and some colonels and other people who are involved. Um, and they're really interested in piloting um, this among a small group of 
Army and Navy um, students, they, they're, they're kind of thinking about it as a sort of on-ramping strategy where they'll start with a, with a small test pilot and then they'll sort of get bigger and bigger. One of the issues that they're dealing with logistically is the granularity, the difference in granularity of metering data at the US Army versus the Navy. Um, so there are just definitely some logistical things to work out. Um, they also had an energy competition last year, but it was just between or within the um, U.S. Uh, military academy. So they are between the, mili uh, the army and the navy. They're still looking at sort of the logistics of that. But um, it seems that it could happen as soon as next spring. Hi, um, I was just wondering how you were able to estimate um, how much more money. Um, the schools would save if they competed against one another because the difference was pretty large. So that, that was based on the Campus Conservation uh, Nationals, which is, as we mentioned briefly, the largest nationwide energy competition. Um, 100 to 150 schools participate. So what we did was we looked at the data from that competition and talked to some of the organizers and determined that the average savings uh, were about nine kilowatt hours per student last year and that at the high end schools were saving 25 kilowatt hours per student. Um, so our expectation it, based on the rivalry between Army and Navy is that if schools that were just off competing against themselves essentially, you know, dorm against dorm, were able to get 25 kilowatt hours uh, that with this rivalry and especially considering the you know, perhaps higher level of discipline uh, at the military and naval academies, um, that it could be reasonably expected that they could achieve it at the high end that was seen in CCN. <clears throat> I was just curious whether you ran up against any sort of security type uh, questions at any point, if there were any situations where you couldn't get access to information or maybe in the context <laughs> of rolling things out further if people flagged uh, information they might have trouble sharing. Uh, yeah. Um, <laughs> well, so um, it's not so much security, there were no like, uh, classified issues with this data, but I mean, as, as a scientist, I'm sure you run into difficulties obtaining data, and it was no different with this project. Um, we had to beg them for their energy bill, um, and even then, we are only allowed to share a limited amount of information about that. Um, and, and sort of obtaining data is one of the, was one of the difficulties with this project, but Ultimately, I think we got everything we needed and we were able to build an economic case with the data that we were given. Obviously, more data is always better. Um, I'd also just like to note that in terms of like the Lucid platform or something along those lines, a lot of the, <clears throat> excuse me, a lot of the um, data we'd be using would be for the residential buildings and the classrooms. So in terms of it being a military installation, I don't think those problems would necessarily be as you know, important as it might be somewhere else in the military. Nice job, uh, great work, so uh, very interesting. The, my question is, to what degree is your first recommendation dependent on your second? And what, are there cheaper ways to be able to create a mock bill that tracks individual students without the $50,000 investment? Yeah, um, so I mean, we told them this when we spoke to them. We could start a mock billing program today. Um, the question is, how effective do you want it to be? Um, and, and this is why essentially everything came down in the end to, to having a, a central hub for sustainability on campus that can um, not just manage these projects but also um, keep them a priority um, and have people on, in the military academy who, whose priority it is to do, these, do this work. Um, every single person who has sustainability um, in their title um, has it tacked on somewhere at the end um, after their primary responsibilities. Um, and, and that was one of the reasons why we felt that you, know, you have to have an office um, where these projects can be managed out of. Um, I think another, another level to that is that um, you know, it really, a, a mock billing program, um, a feedback system, it all depends on the granularity of the data. Um, and so if you, you know, we could measure essentially right now, we could measure building by building. Um, but like the less, the more um, the numbers are tied to individuals, the greater the potential for behavioral change. Um, and you know, just to bring in another, another kind of behavioral economics thing, like you and if you say your building's using this much energy, um, you immediately have free riders who are like, well, you know, it doesn't matter. Like my energy use doesn't matter. And so the idea, the, the ideal situation would be to um, to meter room by room, or to be able to get data room by room. Um, if not that, then floor by floor, um, building by building is obviously um, 
you know, a possibility. And so that, that kind of data could be collected right now. Um, I, I, we question, essentially, how, how valuable that information would be. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Sarah Lavenhar. I'm the project manager for the group Organic Foundations. Uh, we were able to work with McEnroe Organic Farm this semester, and we were tasked with figuring out ways in which they could expand both their compost and live roof, or also known as green roof, media into New York City and the surrounding area. So I'm going to go over the project a little bit, um, the process and some of the challenges we faced, and then hit on uh, the three big areas that we focused on and then our final recommendations. So McEnroe is an organic farm in upstate New York. Uh, they are, they call themselves sort of a, a large, they're large and diverse for a small farm. Uh, they have a, a number of different kinds of production, um, vegetables, animals, uh, and it's, it's really, they're quite a wonderful group of people. Um, but their main income is from their compost project. Uh, it, they spend about, it, um, about 50 percent of the, the compost they produce is actually used on their farm. Um, and what this compost enables them to do is fulfill this wonderful, amazing mission that they have, which is basically to promote a new model of sustainable agriculture. And this also includes things like education and agritourism and really redefining the way that we think about food. So this is a picture of McInerney's compost operations. As I said, it's basically the, the very foundation of everything that they do. And they already have a thriving compost business. They sell from Georgia to Maine, and they're, and they're reasonably well known. And they've managed to accomplish this with basically no marketing. Uh, it's word of mouth and Google searches, and that's how they've got around. And the other element that we looked at is green roof media. So they also use their compost as part of developing a green roof media. Now, not everyone may know what a green roof is. It's a variety of green infrastructure uh, that can be intensive, which means it requires a lot of care, can be extensive, which is the variety that you see here. And these are used uh, in buildings largely in cities, flat roofs. They provide a number of benefits, including uh, they reduce the urban heat island effect, they are great for stormwater runoff mitigation, and they can reduce energy costs for the building. And the area that we are concerned with is this, this extensive growing media layer, which is what McEnroe has the ability to produce. So this is how we decided to tackle this project. We framed it with four basic questions, which is what is the state of both the compost and green roof market? What are the unique opportunities for McEnroe to stand out? How can we get the product to that market? Because one of the biggest issues that McEnroe raised was the, the transportation costs were the biggest problem for getting into the city. And then how can we maximize McEnroe's environmental responsibility in keeping with their mission? So, process. Basically, we had to figure out the different areas that each of us wanted to look at and the essential questions for each of those areas. And it, things seemed a little bit disparate at first. as like, how does compost and green roofs overlap? Where are we going to manage to get these things to come together? Um, but everybody picked different general areas of responsibility. And as it turned out, there was a fair amount of overlap. Then we started doing literature reviews. We also conducted a number of online and phone surveys with businesses, community gardens, networks in the city that deal with both compost and green roof. And then finally, we gathered a series of contacts and sources of information for the client's future use. And we also developed a very extensive report with recommendations for each of these study areas. Um, some of the challenges we faced, most of them were related to communication. Uh, it is a working farm, and they do not have a large amount of staff, so sometimes communication with them was a little bit challenging, but whenever they did get back to us, they always had great information. We also had a lot of issues with communicating with green roof companies, since a lot of the questions that we were asking them were actually proprietary information, which they were unwilling to share with college students. Uh, there was also limitations of available data, things like prices and quantities similar to this. And then um, we, the one of the other ones that we really struggled with was we were looking into biochar, which is what I'm going to talk about next, um, but it was highly experimental, and so presenting this as something that we wanted McEnroe to look at was a little bit of a risk. 
So what is biochar? Biochar is a carbonized biomass produced through thermal decomposition in little or no oxygen. There's two different kinds of boilers. There's either um, a gasification or a pyrolysis process. And we were looking at this as a possible replacement for what is called expanded shale in green roof growing media. So in, a, in extensive green roof growing media, about 80 to 90 percent of the media is made of this expanded shale or a similar kind of mineral material. And then 10 to 20 percent is organic material. But expanded shale requires a lot of energy to produce. It also has to be mined. So it has a fairly significant environmental impact. And it can be fairly high cost. So we're looking into biochar as an alternative option um, for reasons I will explain shortly. So one of the things that we looked at was the possibility of just converting the, the furnaces that Mackinac already had. But unfortunately, they proved not convertible because they couldn't produce the, the high heat that was still required. Um, but what we, we, what we did look at is the economic viability and whether it was possible for McEnroe to actually purchase new boilers or whether they could look at buying instead. And what we found was that they could actually make this financially feasible and be paid back somewhere between 5 and 15 years, depending on the kind of benefits they got. Um, and in the meantime, they could try uh, buying biochar and experimenting with it and playing with it to see what kind of numbers that they actually needed. So the reason we were looking into biochar is because it has a lot of benefits. Because it's a carbonized biomass, it's very stable, it sequesters CO2, and there's actually right now um, in the works with the American Carbon Registry a methodology for how to get carbon credits through biochar. So that was something that was kind of interesting. Uh, biochar has also been shown to have great nutrient retention and in green roofs reduce nutrient runoff. And because of the, uh, the amount of heat that's produced, there's actually a, a way to do cogeneration. So they could use these boilers not only to create a useful product, but also heat their greenhouses. So they wouldn't need to be using propane, and they also wouldn't need to be continuing to use the other furnaces. And then more of a marketing side of things, um, biochar also has possible benefits for lead certification points. So you can get anywhere, I think, from two to six points by using locally, and, uh, locally sourced and recycled materials, which biochar is. So that is actually a substantial number of points in LEED certification. So we are also obviously looking at compost. And we looked at both the urban and the suburban market, because what we realized when we were looking into New York City is that it is kind of a shrinking market. Gardens and the city as a, as a whole are looking to become self-sufficient in terms of producing compost. So what we recommended for McEnroe is that they really work on seasonal targeting, because there are still times when gardens need high quality compost, and also possibly doing one time uh, options for distribution for gardens that are, for example, uh, they have short-term or medium-term leases on a certain plot of land, and they really need to get that soil going quickly. And then also building sustainable relationships with pre-existing networks and using a CSA-style model to distribute things so that the cost is less over a, a larger number of gardens. We also looked at the suburban compost market, which proved to be uh, probably the most lucrative option for McEnroe. And one of the biggest things that we found that that landscapers kept telling us is that quality assurance, certification, testing was absolutely key. They had a lot of trouble sourcing locally because they couldn't find high quality compost that they also could get consistently. So this was something that McEnroe can provide, but they really need to be able to prove it to these landscapers, which is why we suggested that they subscribe to uh, green landscaping associations and get these kinds of certifications. And there are also opportunities for doing CSA-style distribution, for example, using Cornell Extension offices as knowledge sources to find the networks in suburban areas. So we also did a number of investigations for the green roof market. We did a cost-benefit analysis in order to get a sense of whether McEnroe's product could actually be competitive on the market. And it turned out that it was. They actually have a fairly low cost by comparison to some of the other ones that we were looking at. And we compared this using historical data from projects that were done in New York City from 2007 to 2013, as well as a US GSA survey that was done. We also did market analysis to look for similar networks and options that uh, we had to the compost. And th what we really came away with is that having standards, uh, adhering to certain standards like FLL guidelines or Green Roof for Healthy City is really, really important. And that if McEnroe wants to go into this, they should pursue long-term partnerships with either contractors or existing Green Roof companies rather than doing a one-stop shop. 
So overall, we had a bunch of marketing recommendations. As I mentioned, quality assurance is key. We also made a number of recommendations for their website, especially highlighting the fact that they can do these custom blends for both compost and for the green roof media, and also having profiles of their existing projects, because right now they really don't advertise at all that they have their green roof media already out there functioning, working fantastically, and that they really need to actually start engaging in advertising, that they should join uh, one of the online membership-based organizations like GreenRoofs.com or GreenRoofs for Healthy Cities and really have a comprehensive marketing strategy in order to help them get their name out there and stand out. And finally, we have a series of distribution recommendations that came from as a result of our research, um, such as retailing with local garden centers and restaurant partnerships were actually really interesting. We gave them a series of restaurants that actually grow their own food in the city on rooftop farms or similar that could be a small source of income, but a great way for to get some great PR and then also engaging in what is called backhaul transport in order to reduce overall transportation costs. But the big one was really that they have got to have a marketing strategy. They need to start investing money in this, and that is the way that we think that they're going to be able to overcome the fact that the transportation costs are so high. So I guess at this time, I have the rest of my team come up, and they can answer any questions related to the areas that they focused on. <laughs> Sir, I would just ask how receptive they were to biochar and if you think they're going to try it. They were actually surprisingly interested. We were actually really, um, we were worried at first that it was going to be a lot more expensive, uh, that it was going to take like 30 years to pay back buying one of those stoves, but we, the, the numbers worked out pretty well and they seemed like that was something that they were going to actually be willing to explore in the future. Um, so I think that they're at very least going to play around with testing even if they don't go ahead with buying the furnace, because it is, it is a large investment. Can I also add something? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, and, um, and there were actually some of the farms in the New England region that is actually re experimenting with the biochar, both producing and selling, and also applying their biochar to the, one of their products, such as like soil products or compost, and such as. So I think they really ha had an interesting outlook for the biochar at their own farm. Thanks. Terrific. Uh, you mentioned initially, I think, that the transportation was a really big issue. Did you have some suggestions to help them crack it? Well, the, the overall message was basically that we think that if they, they increase their marketing, then they'll be able to have more customers in, an, in a given area that say that we want to buy your compost, bring it here, and that way it makes it worth it to make that trip because the more that they can take to a given location to drop off, the less expensive the transportation cost is per customer. Hi, we are Team Tomato Tourism Team. So our client was same as the composting group, and um, we are gonna discuss about our project here. So our project was focused on the um, expanding our um, their agritourism project in New York City. So we wanted to increase the awareness of the um, their agritourism project with the social marketing strategy and develop the relationship with the uh, community center and community garden and local schools. So this project, this pr uh, presentation will focus on the strategy and progress and outcome and um, talk about the moving forward to sustain um, the momentum. So first we are talking about the um, the market research based strategy that um, that could be the the foundation of all the projects that we did. So we actually did canvas uh, on the street in Manhattan, like uh, in Upper West Side and East Side and Union Square in um, Bryant Park for two two months basically, and we collected 84 sample size. So um, we did this canvassing for verify the feasibility of the agritourism project, and also we wanted to establish the target audiences, and uh, we wanted to identify the attractions and constraints to. Um, to do uh, problem solving and like design the effective marketing strategy. So as a result, we found out that about 80% of people were interested in going to a farm, which means that um, the market size in New York City is pretty big. 
And also we divided into gender and age and previous experience groups, which means that people with uh, previous experience to go to a farm or not. So we found out that we, people with previous experience of going to a farm had a lot stronger interest in going to a farm. And people who are females and teenagers and seniors, they had stronger um, interest in going to a farm than other people. So major constraints to going to a farm that according to the uh, New Yorkers was um, time and transportation. And the major attractions was um, education program and fresh meal. So based on this marketing um, research, we expanded the um, outreach programs. Right, so uh, we developed a, um, as Young said, an outreach campaign based on our canvassing results. And um, we focused on three distinct areas. Um, we developed promotional materials. We worked to increase McEnroe's internet presence. And we um, worked to develop partnerships with um, urban organizations such as community centers, community gardens, and schools. Um, so to develop promotional materials, the idea was to increase awareness of McEnroe in the city because as we found out from canvassing, there is a lot of interest in visiting farms that people might not necessarily be aware of the um, opportunities at McEnroe. So we actually designed two types of promotional materials, brochures and um, postcards. So we did research about effective design and we based our designs off of that. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have samples here for you, but <laughs> perhaps we can email them out or something. <laughs> um, the other thing that we focused on in addition to design was effective distribution of these materials. So um, we did some research and we found out that promotional materials are most effectively distributed in niche markets. And that means markets that have high concentrations of audiences that have demonstrated interest in the product. So McEnroe is offering the opportunity to, um, to engage with sustainable food and organic, sustainable agriculture and organic food. So um, the audiences that have demonstrated an interest are those that are interested in sustainable agriculture and organic food. So therefore, um, we recommended that distribution be focused at, uh, for example, health food stores and green markets that products specialize in organic food and sustainable agriculture. Also, we found that um, High visibility areas are also very effective distribution areas simply because there's a high degree of exposure. So we also recommend distribution in such areas. In New York, that means places like Starbucks, and it also means highly trafficked grocery stores like Whole Foods, which also has the added benefit of attracting the niche demographic. Um, our second approach was to increase McEnroe's internet presence. Uh, we live in an age where many people use the internet and therefore it would be um, highly useful for McEnroe to expand their internet presence. And we focused on um, for a variety of websites from tourism websites to blogs and special interest sites like the Whole Foods blog and Grow NYC. Um, and we did some research about this and the, the benefits of being featured on such web websites are well documented. Um, we also looked at the type of content that is usually written up on these websites, so um, we developed some template write-ups for McEnroe. Um, and the reason that we developed templates rather than going ahead and producing full write-ups is because McEnroe has to improve all of the wording and go through a discussion with their executive board. So we just um, developed some templates to get the ball rolling for them. And um, based on our findings from all of these websites, we concluded that it would be better to focus on unique opportunities and the benefits that uh, the opportunities that McEnroe offer the client rather than, for example, history about the farm. And that is because uh, people who visit these, si these sites are interested in having fun. So the takeaway is to emphasize fun. Um, Finally, we worked on developing urban community partnerships. We focused on community centers and community gardens primarily because they uh, target the niche demographics of younger people, older people, and people who have a demonstrated interest in sustainable agriculture. Um, and they also, community centers have the ability to organize transportation, um, which overcomes one of the chief constraints, which was transportation. And also, because they regularly organize field trips, this implies that their memberships have the time to take such trips, so that overcomes the um, barrier of time as well. So um, we worked on reaching out to these. Uh, we worked on narrowing down a subset of high potential 
community centers and community gardens, and we established contact information for them and made some preliminary efforts at uh, reaching out and establishing contact. However, um, in the end, we focused more on creating partnerships with schools because we got responses more rapidly, and Lisa will talk about that now. Hey, um, so I'm gonna talk about how we targeted urban schools. So um, our main goal um, about, um, our main goal for reaching out to schools in New York City was to really try to expand McEnroe's um, presence um, in, in the city. And uh, the unique thing about McEnroe is that um, it's very focused on education about sustainable agriculture. It has a number of um, existing partnerships with um, with local schools nearby the farm um, where students take regular field trips to the farm and have lessons on a bi-weekly basis and they also volunteer on the farm uh, throughout the school year and throughout the summer. So McEnroe's um, goal for us was um, to really try to expand to the city and see if we can um, uh, interest some schools in having a similar long-term partnership with them. <laughs> Um, so obviously there's um, a, uh, the largest constraint in having schools, um, schools in New York City come to McEnroe is the, is the time factor, distance factor, uh, McEnroe is about two hours away, um, and uh, as well as the cost. And so uh, McEnroe originally also wanted to um, see if we could reach out to some lower income schools as well. So um, that was also um, a barrier that we had to overcome. So. Um, so in reaching out to schools, we came up with this timeline of phases um, where we tried to uh, organize um, how schools would um, progress in becoming a long-term partner with McEnroe. So, um, yeah, so basically, in the end, um, our, um, our, um, our goal as, uh, as our, um, our team's goal was to really um, make an initial outreach effort to the schools and just try to get them interested to see if um, McEnroe is something that they would like to um, uh, partner with so um, yeah so overall we were able to reach out to six schools um, uh, six schools expressed a very positive interest in uh, McEnroe's and McEnroe's um, mission and so um, uh, currently we were able to get them all to um, phase three so um, right now we're working on the handover to McEnroe in which they um, in which they can actually organize a field trip sometime um, in the in the near future and then possibly um, become a long-term partner which would be very exciting um, and so uh, these were our recommendations to McEnroe. Um, really, it, it's, a, it's a lot about outreach efforts. Um, uh, and these are the three schools that we had the most progress with. Um, and, uh, let's see. and so uh, in the end, we, um, we did a lot of research on schools in New York City, and we found that there's really been a lot of effort by the New York City administration to, um, to build school gardens throughout the city, especially in public schools, because there are a lot of studies have shown that there's a really strong correlation between um, school gardens, education about sustainable agriculture, and, um, and improved academic performance. So um, as this picture of Bloomberg and, uh, and uh, Christine Quinn shows, there's really been a lot of interest in trying to build uh, school gardens. So, um, so uh, our goal for McEnroe was that we recommend that they reach out to schools that already have these existing um, school gardens uh, built by the uh, New York City, uh, New York City uh, Department of Parks. And, and so um, we also think that McEnroe should also um, uh, look into applying to certain grants. Um, and then there's also this program called Grow to Learn. Um, I don't know how many of you have already heard of it, but they provide $2,000 uh, worth of grant money to um, public schools throughout the city to build school gardens. So we wanted to try, um, we, re we recommended to McEnroe that they try to partner with Grow to Learn to see if they can expand their outreach to schools from the top down. Um, okay. Cool, and then um, the final aspect of our project was working to improve the user experience of the McEnroe website. So this is a screenshot of the current McEnroe website and highlighted in red are a few um, shortcomings we found with the website. So uh, we analyzed the website for these shortcomings and also used principles of good web design to come up with a new design for them. So this is the design that we have created. Um, this would be the front page and as you can see we focused on a personal touch, um, cohesive detail, a gripping photograph to capture people's interest, and distinct iconography so that um, people can easily take in information quickly rather than having to read everything because typically people do not spend too much time focusing on large blocks of text on a website. We also made um, recommend that there's interactivity and easy scrolling. So this is an example of if you were to scroll down 
the page further. And we also see there's a clear organization which makes it easy for the user to navigate. Um, and uh, clear headings and nice photos to break up the text. So we just made some recommendations for Macroneuro's website based on the template we designed. And also, we made some recommendations about how they might go about implementing this. For example, using a bootstrap and asking smart questions when they're looking for a web developer. Um, so in conclusion, we have compiled a list of deliverables for Macanero, which includes um, the results of our research, contact information for schools, community centers, community gardens, uh, our mock write-ups, our potential website design. Um, and we have made recommendations for them to pursue uh, partnerships with community centers and community gardens as well as schools. But um, we have found that all of these aspects of agritourism require significant time and effort. And McInerno is currently a little bit short staffed, so we recommended that they think seriously about devoting more time and effort to agritourism if they are um, interested in truly expanding it. But we do feel that they have great potential. So thank you. Any questions? Has McEnroe thought about partnering with other nonprofits that are doing similar programs in schools? I know that like Roots and Shoots is one that does a lot of like urban composting and something like that. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, well, currently they, I don't um, I don't think they have like any like um, established partnerships with uh, nonprofits in the city yet. But um, that was definitely something that we looked into, like Grow to Learn, or um, I believe there was um, some other programs like the. Green Gorillas, I, yeah. I, I believe, um, that also um, worked with this sort of thing. So um, yeah, currently they don't, um, they're, I think, um, well right now they're, um, they're working with the New York Horticultural Society, so, um, uh, but I don't think they have yet gotten anything off the ground with them, but um, yeah, right now they're still in the process because um, uh, everything with their outreach to New York City schools has been. Um, yeah. And it's in the very nascent yeah, phases. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. um, we'd did also recommend for them to utilize existing linkages between community centers, community <coughs> gardens, and schools to sort of facilitate more of a long-term relationship. So that was another thing. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs>
and it is easier to actually validate a portion of the model using a specific point throughout this entire river uh, system. Okay, so the goal for objective one was to compile data and assess the data to then be used in objective two, which is a model validation process of the Venson model. Um, the data that we used was sourced from the University of Delaware. It included average monthly temperatures as well as uh, monthly total precipitation over four regions uh, for the years 1971 through 2008. Um, the needs for the objective two analysis were uh, over three decades only. So we uh, compiled that da our data into three decades uh, yearly averages um, and then provided minimum, maximum, and standard deviation uh, statistics on each of those. Um, and this is what we came up with. Uh, the results were in millimeters per year. Um, and yes, uh, the focus was region three, which is in the yellow box. Um, so I'm part of the Objective 2 team, which was tasked to validate Bruce's existing model. Um, and validation in general is just a process of establishing com confidence and determining the soundness of the model. The problem with this task at hand is that a systems dynamic model in general, especially one that is focused on physical, um, complex physical relationships, is not very um, adequate in terms of the data and the things that go into this complex physical process. So that being said, um, our methodology involved uh, getting the data and simplifying it, which was objective one, um, running the model, and then performing an analysis on it. So in order to do this, we consulted Dr. Paul Brock, who is currently an assistant professor of civil and environmental engineering at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, and he proposed a methodology that used hind, cast, hind casting, which takes observed uh, precipitation and temperature values and runs it through the model in order to get uh, stream flow values that we can compare to observed historical stream flow values. And in this way, we're trying to predict the past to see if the model is actually accurate. The problem with the Venson model is that it's probability based as opposed, so it cannot take a time series. So we had to provide this statistical summary of the data into decades, um, which only provided us three data points for our analysis. So that was a big limitation in our study in general. So here are the results of our analysis. And if you just look at the average um, values, you can't really see that much of the difference. But if we look at the standard deviation, the Venson outputs does not have that much variation in terms of their decadal averages, whereas the observed stream flow does show a lot of different variation. And this is especially highlighted in the stream flow minimum and maximum values, where you see in the green, the two green ones, um, that is the actual observed stream flow, and there is a lot of variation, whereas the Vensum output doesn't have any variation at all. So this just draws a big um, red flag for the model in and of itself. And actually, um, our client, Dr. Bruce Keith, um, contact contacted us this morning saying that he looked over the model this weekend and found a major error in um, just the hydrology portion of it because of um, our validation. So that being said, um, we have a lot of limitation to this study because um, this is a comparison as opposed to a traditional validation. Um, and also, in terms of Bruce's model, he doesn't take spatial scale into consideration at all in terms of the hydrology, which will mess up his numbers a little bit. And also, hydrology is a very complex natural system, which a system dynamic model can't really take into account that well. And we only focus on temperature and precipitation to get these stream flow outputs, which is just one really small portion of a really larger physical process. And Rihanna's gonna talk more about um, groundwater recharge, which is just, again, another small portion of this bigger system. And she's gonna provide a case study of getting better numbers for this model. So um, objective three was tasked with analyzing how much, ground how much uh, precipitation goes into the groundwater in the Nile River Basin for um, the Venson model of Dr. Keith. Um, to do so, we outlined the influencing factors just to show to the client that uh, this is a complex natural system and that a lot of things actually go into um, generating uh, this output. Uh, we also uh, outlined our methodologies for calculation and our methods and results. It is worth noting that um, me and my colleague looked at over 20 different methods for calculating groundwater, and we outlined uh, all these methods in the report, again, to show to our client that 
Um, this is very complex, and even the scientific community that hasn't agreed on a one way of calculating these things. We were actually able to carry out two methods and get uh, results from them. And um, the first one is called the soil moisture budget. Um, so basically what it does is that it takes the main big components of um, the water cycle, which is precipitation, evapotranspiration, um, runoff, and changes in soil moisture to calculate this R uh, term here, which is uh, groundwater recharge, which is what we're looking at. Um, and so our results uh, ranged from um, zero percent of precipitation going into groundwater to 7.7, um, 72 percent. Our second method is called the river base flow method. Um, it's the second method that we, we actually carried out um, calculations for. Uh, this method assumes that low flow conditions in the river can be used as a proxy for approximating groundwater recharge. And to do so, we use this equation, um, and then we calculated um, percentages of precipitation that go into groundwater. Um, we did it for the years 1976 to 2008, and our results showed uh, minimum values of 0.63% and a maximum of 4.1% uh, with an average of 1.51%. All right, thank you, Rihanna. Uh, our work focused exclusively on the nested hydrology model within our client's larger system dynamics model. Given the hydrology model's key role with regard to issues such as water consumption and land use, which rely on the outputs of the hydrology model. Uh, this graphic sort of summarizes our approach of moving from the broad to the specific, starting with regional data collection and analysis, uh, moving through validation of our client's model uh, outputs against observed data from our selected stream gauge station, and then honing in on a survey of groundwater recharge calculation methods, which is a key factor uh, essentially forming a case study as noted. Um, these, this technique of increasingly specific focus may be useful in determining the precision of other subsections of the Venson model or the model as a whole. Uh, and as Yvonne previously noted, uh, it did allow our client to notice uh, an error in his algorithms to allow him for greater precision in his future work with it. Uh, in terms of our recommendations, a complete summary will be available in our report, but some key points are as follows. Regarding data, we recommend an extensive examination into intra-annual trends in occurrence of wet and dry events, including the possible impact of El Nino. Uh, again, we are pretty much focused at the decadal level, and this uh, greater granularity would assist in prediction and preparation for extreme events, as well as policy recommendations and infrastructural decision making. Uh, regarding modeling, uh, we recommend that future cooperation between West Point and Columbia University consider some of these inherent challenges of using a systems dynamic model for complex physical processes such as hydrology modeling, giving the challenges of modeling factors such as groundwater re recharge, as Rihanna discussed, or other factors like evapotranspiration. Uh, and regarding um, groundwater recharge in particular, given the many, many factors that influence it, we recommend further exploration of calculation methods, especially those that incorporate direct measurement or chemical tracing. And one overall recommendation not specific to uh, a particular objective, we recommend uh, relying on further field research in the area given data scarcity in the region, which was a limiting factor in our analysis. Uh, thank you for your time and attention. I now yield the floor. Very nice. Um, I noticed that you paid a lot of attention to temporal scales, but I'm wondering what was the um, s the spatial scale? Was it a watershed? Was it a, ge a geographical or political boundary that you used? And had you looked into um, other <coughs> kinds of spatial scales as well, like uh, political boundaries versus watershed type boundaries? 
Um, ultimately, we focused on the Blue Nile region of the Ethiopian highlands, um, displayed on the previous slide. Uh, our clients' work focuses actually across um, the entire Nile River Basin, which was divided into four uh, regions, um, roughly based on, again, the Blue Nile, um, the main thread of the Nile that goes through Egypt, the White Nile, and the Sudan. Um, and we ultimately found that focusing specifically on the Ethiopian highlands uh, was useful because it was upstream, it was an elevated region that experienced greater rainfall. Um, and by being able to hone in on a specific region, we were able to um, narrow down some of the factors that impacted it. So, anyone else want to add anything? Or? Good afternoon, my name is Sham, and today I'm excited to present to you the findings of our team's project, which is entitled Climate Change and Crop Yields, a Water-Driven Analysis of Food Production and Social Impact in the Nile River Basin. And my team is comprised of myself, my co-project manager, Joe Gurton, our data team, two members who are up right now, Peter, Nam, and Sabrina, and our research team, Ati, Monica, Kyle, and Damien. And our designated client for this project is Dr. Keith Bruce from USMA, and I'll speak more about that later on. As for our agenda today, I'll take you through our research, and uh, I'll cover the context in which our research was done and the question that our research seeks to answer. Uh, next, I will briefly go over our methodology. Then my colleague Ati will go over country profiles, which is a briefing on the crop selection and uh, our examination of the top three countries in our research. This is followed by Nam and, At, uh, Nam and Peter's uh, explanation about AquaCrop, which, which is the modeling program we use for our project, our results and an analysis, and I'll wrap everything up in the end with our, uh, how our work will be used in uh, future products and the recommendations we offer to the countries we're researching. Uh, just briefly, I wanted to introduce the, the concerns that we're trying to address for our project. In the region of the Nile River Basin, which is in East Africa, food security is a, is a mounting concern. Uh, that tied in with rapid population growth, uh, water scarcity due to climate change, and the growing tensions built around the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is projected to be uh, complete in 2017, has brought up a lot of questions as, uh, as far as agriculture development, water security, and regional security in East Africa, and how, many, how there are many different international players taking part in this. And our piece in this is to build a connection between crop availability, like, so agricultural development, uh, with, this, with water security, which is due to fluctuate because of climate change and the construction of the dam. And this, on, in a greater picture, brings into question the issues of climate change in the area, uh, forced migration, because East Africa is the home to one of the largest displaced populations in the world, um, and furthermore, the propensity for conflict that will arise from lack of resources, miscommunication, and variability in climate, water, and several other factors we're trying to address. Uh, so this is our direct question. Our, our group seeks to illuminate the connection to sta the staple crops in each country, water availability, and we're basing this on uh, research on surface water, groundwater, and rain-fed uh, rain crops, irrigation methods, and climate change. We acknowledge that there are 10 countries along the Nile River Basin, but because of time constraints, we don't have the capacity to address the, the implications for all 10 countries, so we focused our research on Egypt, Sudan. Uh, we understand it's now Sudan, South Sudan, because a lot of the data out there is really centered around Sudan as a whole, and Ethiopia. Furthermore, our, our crop selection methodology is based on 50% uh, of total annual production in tons for each country. So this is how we sought out uh, which crops we were going to examine. And this data was extrapolated from FAO, which is Food and Agriculture Organization. And now we'll have uh, my colleague Ati, and she'll give you a briefing on each country under examination in our research. Thank you, Sham. Um, for the country profiles, we'll be looking at Egypt, Sudan, and Ethiopia, and we'll look at their agriculture practices, irrigation methods, and uh, the main crops in each of the three countries. In Egypt, as you can see, uh, Egypt has about 85, over 85 million people. It's um, 
its GDP is not as reliant on um, agriculture as the other countries. Um, however, during the um, Egypt's population grew substantially during the construction of the Aswan Dam um, in, the 20th, in the beginning of the 20th century. And uh, this is because of the increase in uh, water accessibility. Um, and of the three countries, like I said, it, its uh, population, its workforce or GDP does not really depend on agriculture. Um, however, about 80% of the, the water used in agriculture comes from uh, the Nile River and Egypt is heavily dependent on the Nile River. Um, it's, this dependency uh, is a mounting concern for the propensity of conflict due to potential increased water scarcity in the region. Um, the, main, um, the main crops we chose for Egypt are wheat, sugar beet, tomatoes, and sugar cane, and these uh, together are about 50.27% of its um, annual agricultural production. Um, the Egyptian government has currently um, encouraged the cultivation of sugar cane in the upper Egypt by establishing large, a large number of uh, sugar factories. Um, next we have Sudan. Um, Sudan um, has a population of about 30, 34 million, but the most important thing is its population is growing rapidly, about 1.83%. We're sorry, the GDP composition is not showing up properly on, on, the, prof on the profiles. Um, and the conflict in the region with, the, with South Sudan has created a significant number of refugee populations in the region. Uh, about 80% of um, Egypt's population and 27% of its GDP uh, are dependent on agriculture. Um, Egypt uses a, an, a mixture of um, irrigated and rain-fed agriculture, and it has a huge potential for groundwater resources for, um, for irrigation. The crops in Sudan are onion, sorghum, and sugarcane, which make up about 57% of its annual production. And um, during the food shortages in the 1980s, the government has prioritized productions of uh, crops, mainly sugar, um, sorghum. The other really substantial um, crop, onions, are the main vegetable crop that are uh, produced in, uh, in Sudan. Next, we have Ethiopia, uh, at about 76 million people today. Ethiopia has one of the uh, fastest growing populations in, in Africa at 2.27%. It is a poverty-stricken country, which uh, what makes Ethiopia very unique than the other two countries is its agriculture and its GDP and its workforce heavily depend on, uh, they heavily depend on agriculture, and about 60% of Ethiopia's exports are agricultural, it's agricultural production. Um, Ethiopia um, is currently building the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is expected to be one of the largest dams in, in Africa. And although Ethiopia claims this uh, dam is not going to um, impact the flow of the Nile River, there is mounting concerns by countries like Egypt and Sudan that this is going to be an issue. Uh, the main crops in Ethiopia we're looking at are uh, teff, which is a cereal, sorghum, roots and tubers, and maize. And um, these together amount for about 55% uh, of Ethiopia's annual agricultural production. Um, about 85% of Ethiopia's crops are exported and not consumed locally. Um, now I'll be passing it to Nam, who's going to go over aqua crop. Thank you. Um, so AcroCrop is a crop water productivity model developed by the Land and Water Division of FAO. We select this program because it is specially suited to address conditions where water is a key limiting factor in crop production. So it generates crop yields in tons per hectare, and this is used as an input into the Benson model, which is used by our client, um, Professor Keith. And to generate these yields, we have to create different input files for each of the crop in each of the regions. So there's a climate, and for the crop, we specify the type of crop, whether it's C3 or C4, where C4 is a more um, drought-resistant crop. And there's irrigation, type of soil, groundwater depth, and salinity. And this like, interface of um, AcroCrop, where we put in all the files, we press run, and then it simula um, like, simulates all the yields from historical yields and the future yields. So to, in order to um, um, generate historical data, um, we collected data from weather stations in the crop um, growing zones from 1980 to 2010. And this was um, collected from AGMIP, which is a consortium of like, from Columbia University, University of Florida, University of Oregon, and NASA. 
And um, so the, each of the weather station was selected based on the region where the crops were grown. This is very important because it allowed us to input specific growing conditions for each of the crop into AcroCrop. Um, we also use, um, allows AcroCrop to fill in the data, like in the holes in the data where there wasn't any data recorded. And we also use the stations as a basis to like collect other data for other growing conditions like the groundwater and the soil. Um, and here's a map that shows, and the red shows the weather stations, and this shows the sugarcane yields from AcroCrop. So for the future projections, we had to look at the, um, the impact of climate change on future conditions, and to look at, um, to calculate the change in temperature and precipitation from 2010 to 2099, we used um, the RCP 4.5 and RCP 8.5 model, and this was because this was the one that was used by last um, group's report, and um, RCP 4.5 was is a model where um, radiative forcing stabilized at 4.5 watts per meter squared by 2100, and RCP 8.5 is when it stabilizes 8.5 watts per meter squared. And for CO2 emissions, um, because agricrop is very limited, we couldn't use the same model. We had to use a different model, which was the SRES model, and we used the B1A2 model, where B1 was like the more optimistic one. We made the assumption that it was like kind of comparable, and this was also used by um, last group's report, and there was previous research that shows that um, B1 and A2 are viable predictions for the emissions. And for the other um, files, we held all constant. So now I'll pass on to Peter to analyze the results. Okay, so, mm, so in order to in order to project future climate trends and in return future crop yields, we first averaged uh, daily stats for temperature and precipitation between 1980 to 2010 to form baseline monthly temperatures, and we plugged those values into AquaCrop to generate baseline yields. Uh, afterwards, using last year's predicted temperature and precipitation changes using their GCM selections in three 30-year blocks from 2010 to 2039 and so on to 2099. We applied those changes to our historical temperature and precipitation changes, and we plugged them into AcroCrop and generated yield every five years as an output for each crop. Um, we did that for the RCP 4.5 values and for the RCP 8.5 values. So, so um, I'll be showing everyone our results, but for the sake of time, I'll be just going over the highlights. And if anyone has questions on, our, on details or for, future for further clarifications, just feel free to ask us at the end of the presentation. Uh, so first of all, Sudan. Um, as you can see, for Sudan, for onion and sugarcane, we see that there is a uh, linear growth trend from 2010 to 2099. Um, as expected, the RCP 8.5 values yield a higher future projection versus, a, versus the RCP 4.5 values. But what is interesting here is that for sorghum, which is a C4 crop, which means that they are more temperature resilient, it seems that the carbon process didn't actually matter. And this is surprising to us because we thought that the C3, C4 crop inputs uh, would be significant independent variables in our future crop projections. So here we see that the C3, C4 crop variable does not seem to have much of an impact. And instead, we see huge variability in uh, our results for sorghum. And for this, we have thought of two reasons. First of all, seasonal temperature var variability. And second, precipitation. Um, because the GCM that last, year's semester, last semester's group used, um, Project, projected drastic increases in precipitation levels over the next century. This results in unreliable and extreme precipitation. Um, and because Sudan is very dependent on rain-fed agriculture and irrigation, um, this might have resulted in variability such as this. For Ethiopia, we again see that the C3, C4 variables do not have much of an impact. Um, we see that for TEF, and sugarcane, so we see here TEF first, which is a C3 crop, it becomes more productive, while for other crops, sorghum and maize, there is a significant decrease. For Egypt, we see that um, wheat is a major outlier. All the other crops had a rising productiv productivity trend, and we see that for wheat, at least for the RCP 8.5 yield, we see that uh, after 2055, 
there is a significant drop in the projected e wheat yield. And we say this because there is a something called a threshold effect in which after maximum temperature, after temperature increases to a certain extent, uh, photosynthesis, photosynthesis increases, but at the same time, respiration rates increase as well. So respiration rates might catch up with the levels of photosynthesis, which results in collapsing uh, projected yields such as wheat in 2055. So um, overall, food production rises slightly, but at the same time, major crops such as wheat, maize, and sorghum, uh, productivity drops. And we've noted the highlights of our study in numbers, percentage changes, but because of a lack of time, I won't be going over them. But at the end of the day, these percentages, these significant um, trends in drops and rises don't really tell the full story. And we really need to look at the entire socioeconomic picture that links water, climate change, and food. And we have to realize that this is a lot more complicated than the results that we have come up with right now. And there are other problems such as groundwater, um, export-import problems, and shifting economic sectors. So those are some areas that we need to look at for, for future semesters that will be carrying up on our project. So I'll be handing over the mic to Sham. Thank you, Peter. And I know we just threw a lot of numbers at you and it's a lot of like quantitative information to digest. It's very much a language we had to understand and develop day in and day out, especially the data team this semester. But at, at the end, we would like to translate this into recommendations for the three countries, especially in, in general, all the 10 countries around the Nile River Basin. And although we acknowledge we're an amateur group, uh, we have validated a lot of our research and we feel confident in the recommendations we'll provide. And acknowledging that our client is uh, uh, Dr. Keith Bruce from the USMA and re he represents the, the Center for um, National and Conflict and Capacity Development in East Africa, we would like to steer away the conversation from conflict or propensity for conflict and direct it towards negotiation, how to use these new resources for capacity building in a large, for the next century in East Africa. And with that, in our report, we make recommendations with respect to water management and food production in the region, specific to regions within countries and with themselves, because as we've seen through our results, the crops act differently in, in, within one country. And also we make further uh, recommendations for developing alternative ad adaptation options for various scenarios. And most importantly, we uh, offer recommendations for collaboration between the various development institutions on ground in all three countries and scaling up uh, strategies and projects that are already in effect. So there will be a more unison, a unison effort to address agricultural development within the century uh, and with that addressing climate change and the, and the construction of the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. And lastly, how our deliverables would be used. Uh, we will, directly, our deliverables would be handed off to the USMA, and we're feeding their very extensive, large Venson models, and we're helping them. Their interest is the, the study of propensity for conflict, but we're drawing, we're filling in the gap between food production and water, avail, water scarcity, which I think is a very strong link, as a link as we can all agree, because it, uh, it translates into population growth, uh, conflict, communication, and several different factors that are very important for the region. And furthermore, which I, I think we can all acknowledge is very significant, within our research, we build a sound foundation of, of data. Like, uh, this is a lot of material otherwise would not have been uh, sought out. And our team has worked very hard to collect this data, store it, and use it for hopefully uh, further studies in the field. And with that said, I would like to thank you for attending our presentation and for all the support this semester. And I would like to give special thanks to our, uh, our advising team, um, Bradley, Allison, Diane for being there every second of the way and being a guiding force. And also Dean Valentini for coming here with me. I told him about this presentation two weeks ago and he was just so excited to hear what we've all done. And I'm honored that he's invested in our research as much as we have been throughout the semester. With that said, thank you and thank you to the greatest sustainable development. <laughs> Would our team like to come up for if there are any questions? <laughs> yeah, 
Um, when using your aqua crop, aqua crop analysis, what were some of the factors in choosing the weather stations and the climate models that were different for each of the countries? So the weather stations Talk we picked. Uh, yeah, we tried to pick weather stations that were ge just geographically close to cultivation areas for each specific crop. Um, so Ethiopia and Egypt both had, I believe, two weather stations that we were collecting data from, depending on the crop. Uh, Sudan, we just took data from the weather station in Khartoum. As for selecting the GCMs, last semester's group actually did uh, validation for 33 different uh, generalized circulation models dependent on region. So for each country in the region, uh, they ran statistical analyses on each, uh, each variable and determined based on historical data which one for that region would be most likely to produce accurate projections for uh, daily maximum and minimum temperatures as well as precipitation. Um, so we used a different model for Egypt uh, than we did for Sudan and for Ethiopia. Um, wait, very quickly. Yeah, I just wanted to add something. Um, <laughs> on a more logistical note, uh, there is a lack of sufficient and accurate data in the region. And what we realized was it was really difficult to find such accurate data. And so we really benefited from the AgMIP study because they provided us with accurate daily data from 1980 to 19, 2010. Um, and we basically relied on the data that we were provided by AGMIP. And uh, fortunately for us, AGMIP did have those weather stations in Ethiopia, in Sudan, and Egypt that were close to the regions of crop cultivation. So we mainly relied on that data. First of all, I just want to say this is really exciting to see where the research has, has gone this semester. Um, and great work, guys. But I wanted to ask um, a question. So I, I see that you used the approach of the best model and acknowledging that that might not actually be the model that appropriately encompasses all of the variation in climate projections of temperature and precipitation from until 2100. I'm wondering if you guys considered using the interquartile analysis and looking at specific projections for you know, a certain um, model of 20, 25th percentile as well as 75th percentile um, and just, just wondering your justification for using the best model approach. Another logistical note is <laughs> <laughs> because so much of the time was spent on, devoted on finding accurate data, we were really pressed for time. And Erica, thank you so much for your detailed project and your research, which <laughs> unfortunately I didn't get to read all of because it was so long. but. <laughs> Um, at the same time, we really trusted in your group, and that's why we chose your method, the best fit method. And I guess for future groups that really want to expand on our study, they can use interquartile analyses and other um, such measures of analysis. So yeah, we're really hoping to see what the future generations of the <laughs> workshop can do. Um, and just a final note too, um, I think a major limitation is that we are using just one area where the crop is cultivated. And so we compared our findings to um, other studies that have actually used four different GCMs um, in the region and looked at where maybe there could be shifting cultivation. And so even though we weren't able to come up with those results, we were able to actually kind of use a, another study for a baseline uh, against our results. And so um, there will be m more work, I think, to be done, but again, another limitation of study. I know there's a lot to be said about this because the data question really is the center of our project this semester. But another thing um, that we definitely considered is that aquacrop is a deterministic model and something that um, isn't as well taken into account in our process is the extreme variability that we expect to see with climate change in the next 100 years. Um, our approach basically added estimated changes for temperature and precipitation to historical data. So we just incremented everything and it was, it was hard to, to predict how smaller time scale variability might affect crop yield. I just have to know, I'm sorry, does awkward crop include the CO2 or not? Yes. It does. And, and so maybe the C4s dropping out isn't surprising as their, their uh, competitive advantage is lost in high CO2. OK.
Okay, because we went on this long, so we're going to have to cut short here with the questions. I apologize for that. But uh, I want to uh, thank all of you, the audience, for coming. It's really important to us. And I want to thank all of the students uh, for working so hard on their progress this semester and congratulate you for almost being, almost completing your uh, self-devil concentration major. So thanks to everyone.